All right, so welcome everybody. My name is Karl Rupp, so I'm from the Argonne National Labs currently, but as the title suggests, um, the work was carried out mostly in Vienna, which I'm going to present here, um, with my colleagues Florian Rudolph and um, Josef Weinbo. So I, also, as you can probably see from the title, there is none of these like common, let's call it buzzwords. Um, so there is nothing like boost or like dispatch thing. So um, you might wonder, what is this all about? Um, yeah, so first of all, the Vienna Libraries term. So um, basically, I'm a computational scientist. So my background is uh, microelectronics, um, simulating transistors, basically. And yeah, looking at library support in that area, in C++, um, yeah, you might notice there is hardly anything which is like really usable. I mean, sometimes it's labeled C++ library, but essentially it's C plus maybe use the template for um, dispatching for flow to double or something. So it's not like real C++. So yeah, basically our intention now was, well, if there is nothing, then well, let's build something. And yeah, so that's basically what started th about three years ago. Um, it started with Vienna CL and then a couple of other libraries were just added. But it's not just libraries because as computational scientists, we also have to basically deliver simulations. That means um, having these basic building blocks available, um, we basically combine them and then we build applications on, on top of it. So applications um, means particularly device simulators, but there's also other things which you, which you, well, just the way you use it, you would not term libraries. Okay, so what is covered in this talk? So um, first of all, the computational scientist is um, a strange animal. Um, which requires a bit of additional explanation. Um, we heard parts of it actually yesterday already in the Charm++ plus plus talk. We also, heard, we also heard quite a lot about it on um, Monday's uh, plenary talk. But I should just summarize a bit more on that. Um, what is also in this talk is GPU computing. So there is quite some yeah, interesting interaction between like high-level C++, low-level GPU stuff. Um, then, yeah, importance of, or basically showing we can provide high-level interfaces even for something as complicated as comp computational science can get. Um, and most importantly for us um, is we don't want to have monolithic code because at some point we might end up just throwing it all, all we have into one package which grows to like 100,000 lines of code. But if you then have a new student coming, he, will, he or she will get completely lost in that like, yeah, hodgepodge of code. Um, yeah, and uh, we will also have quite a quite a well a journey from the math to the code and back. So basically, we will quite ha uh, we'll have quite a lot of math in here. What is not covered is to a large extent C plus plus eleven. I will occasionally point at it, but um, yeah, essentially as was as was, uh, as it was already mentioned on Monday's plenary talk, as it was mentioned by Charm plus plus talk yesterday. Um, we cannot, we cannot just jump onto the latest technology if we don't have like large support for the machines out there. So basically we need to have at least a fallback to this um, C++ um, 98 standard. Okay, um, also the max, uh, we're not basically talking about, yeah, maximize the use of, poo of boost. That is, um, yeah, it's not, oh, we can use boost here, so um, we use it. I'm not going to cover this here. So as I mentioned, you will have quite some math in here. Um, yeah, I'm trying not to overdo it with the math, but occasionally you will, you will see something. Um, on the other hand, it's also not going to be super simplistic, so it's probably nothing um, like, yeah, finding x. Um, so if we basically like have time, so time during the presentation over the amount of math, then at the beginning we'll quite have a steep slope, but I try to keep it moderate. Here the first peak, then the, the math sort of, yeah, doesn't get too complicated. But at the end, it's, so if, if I could basically just spend ages talking about math and all the things here. But I assume that the audience probably is not that much into math, even though there are people who just love to talk about the math part here. Um, but probably you will toast me for just talking about the math. So. Um, what, what you can do in, or, in order to basically avoid getting to that peak, uh, peak here is 
ask questions. So if you ask plenty of questions, we'll basically stay here in this regime, and basically we'll skip here, math part here. But there's a lot of like nice code and mapping math to code involved over here. All right, so the computational scientist, a strange animal. Um, yeah, basically, the goal for a computational scientist is to yeah, do science and not execute code. Um, that in particular means basically, ah, oh, I just want to get this paper published, and yeah, every dirty hack is acceptable just to get the results. Um, which also means code is often just yeah, piled together as a like proof of concept, and um, code is usually never designed to be anything like um, something that survives the next paper or probably the end of the project. This means even, even looking at current computational science codes, most of them were initially just, um, yeah, probably put on a web page because, yeah, it was just, yeah, show off what we were doing. But they were usually never designed to be in any way large scale. And by large scale, I mean not just like scaling to multiple machines. I also mean large scale in the sense of community management, um, doing proper or having code in a, in a code repository, proper documentation. All these things are, well, hard to find in the computational science community. So, and the other thing is um, scientists receive software training from scientists. Um, just one example on this. Um, I know cases where students are said, like, you have to use Fortran because this is the only language I, as a supervisor, understand. Um, so this is basically also adding to what was already said on Monday's plenary talk. Um, then there is also this trade-off of performance versus portability and maintainability. So um, usually, or pretty often, a computational scientist is looking for performance because this allows him or her to run new things which were formerly impossible. But on the other hand, since the algorithms are getting fairly complex soon, um, there is not everything is sacrificed for the last bit of performance. In particular, um, if you think of like MATLAB or Python approaches, um, there is, so people are willing to accept a slight abstraction penalty if they can get their algorithms organized in a far better way. Um, so also linked with portability, maintainability is also the problem of problem. The issue of running code on clusters, because on clusters you usually have yeah, some job queues which you need to interact with. You have a fairly old software stack because some enterprise Linux system is installed where you probably have, well, there are, all, there are still clusters out there which do not have a, a version of GCC 4. Point whatever. So you really need to have um, sufficient compiler portability on that. Question over there. So the question is, what version of GCC does the blue gene Q at Argon have? Um, the older one. Um, and the answer is, I don't know, but you probably know. OK, so the, <laughs> the <laughs> OK, so just to make the point concrete, 4.2, which is, which is also the basically, um, so for those of you who have been in the QT talk in the morning, 4.2 is also sort of the, the oldest version which is supported by QT5. So, uh, another question. Yes, okay, so the, the comment was that, um, yeah, even, even on a cluster, you usually have the ability to compile your own compiler. So maybe this, maybe the compiler portability is not, not like an issue. Um, so basically my answer on that is, well, a compiler is one thing, and you also have like to deal with the various version of, um, yeah, the libraries installed, things like that. So. Um, it's not just about compiling code, but it's also about interfacing with other packages, which are usually at a far older state than you would expect them. 
So yeah, moving code quickly from your desktop machine to a cluster can be quite a hassle. Okay, okay, so let's move on. Um, then something which is for the last point on that here is um, there is a certain come and go mentality on, in the computational science community. So particularly, um, quite quite a large amount of code is written by PhD students, and usually PhD students hardly stay for more than let's say five years, probably shorter. Um, so um, there is a natural brain drain, which is probably well, considering the complexity of the codes, which is, and, and considering that teams are usually at small scale, which is basically hitting fairly hard here. Okay, so let's consider now basically the, the common thread throughout the whole talk, which is going to be something, yeah, I took from the semiconductor, um, well, from the semiconductor environment I'm embedded in, which is now here is simulating a fin fat. So fin fats. I grabbed here the picture from Intel, which was published two years ago. Um, now it's 3D transistors, basically, which are now in their latest um, hardware generation. And well, in order to simulate such a thing, you basically first of all need to okay, you just grab one one fin out of it, and then we need some geometry, basically describing the geometry of the transistor. And then what you then usually need is some basically discretization of the geometry, so commonly called a mesh, and the procedure of going from the geometry to the grid, well, just call it meshing here. And there was a talk last year by my colleague, Josef. Um, he presented Vienna mesh, which is basically, yeah, wrapping the various meshing kernels. Okay, so that step we consider, like, covered. But in order to get to a simulation result, there is still a lot, of mo a lot more things going on. And basically, um, I tried to cover all the, or most of the steps in, involved in order to get to the result. So one of them is basically handling the uh, grid data structure, which is um, what Vienna Grid is for. So probably you might wonder Vienna Grid, Vienna Mesh, yeah, what's the distinction? Um, so Vienna Grid is really the mesh data structure, and Vienna Mesh is basically the yeah, meshing kernel, which basically transforms the geometry and fills here the grid data structure. Okay, so this is now, we have now a mesh, but in order to basically, yeah, come to a simulation result, we also need to store quantities in some way on the mesh. So material properties, things like that. Um, so basically, here for example, associating vertices with numbers, whatever they mean. It can be pretty lengthy, can be yeah, inhomogeneous in the sense that you have lots of values for certain vertices, but then just a few values for other vertices. So well, this can get quite tricky and hairy, and this is what Vienna data is for. Okay, so this is now the discrete world. Um, then there's also the continuous description, which is the mathematics, or basically the physics going on. So here, for example, um, is the um, Poisson equation for semiconductors already, so here with some right-hand side, which describes the charges. And usually, well, usually you don't see the equations directly depicted in code. But um, Vienna Math is doing just that. So basically, not yeah, substituting the actual physics or the actual mathematical representation by some numbers, which are then magically transferred and hard coded into code. It's really like, yeah, we work with the equation at hand. So yeah, once you have basically a description of the mathematics, then you still need to discretize the whole thing here onto the um, mesh in order to get something which you basically then call simulation. Um, and the, pro, uh, the, the thing we consider here in the talk is the find element method for which the um, respective package is Vienna FEM, which basically connects discrete, the discrete world with the continuous world, so to say. And yeah, for simplicity, we just assume, okay, this results in a linear system of equations, which of course needs to be solved. So X is the thing you're interested in, so you need to invert it system. And for that, um, so in order to come to your solution, and for that, um, there is Vienna CL, which is basically GPU uh, accelerated linear algebra. And this is also what we want to start with. So just to remind you, we have already a linear system, which somehow shows up, and this is what needs to be solved. Okay, so looking at linear algebra, um, 
yeah, looking at boost, you might find boost ooblast. So, well, looking at the abstractions in boost ooblast, they're pretty much, well, nice, I would say, because, um, well, you have here a matrix object with some dimensions, you have vectors, you can then compute inner products of vectors, you can do a vector addition, also like rank one update, so this is more involved, and then triangular solver, so, well, basically, each line tells you immediately what's going on. This is, well, so if you compare this with like blast calls, then you will immediately prefer this representation. It's just nice operator overloads, you have everything. Um, problem with boost ooblast, let's call it a problem, um, is um, it's basically restricted to single core execution. But, well, single cores, that's, that's pretty old fashioned and doesn't, well, doesn't pretty much fit the name boost. So we want to have something like accelerator usage, we want to have multi-core usage, things like that. And if you look at the code approaches out there, this usually means like you have to do some low level, I don't know, OpenCL, CUDA, whatever thing. And you're far away from any convenience like operator overload. So with Vienna CL, rewriting the whole thing, all you need to do is change the namespace. So this means Vienna CL provides you with the matrix objects, provides you with the vector objects, and all the operator overloads you need. So here we have basically GPU accelerated code without basically throwing away all the abstraction we, well, tediously uh, came up with. Um, then there is also more things in Vienna CL which are not in Boost Ublas. For example, um, iterative solvers. So here. If we go back, here um, Ublas basically offers just triangular solvers. So here, for example, this is the upper triangular solver, which is selected by upper tag. Now, Vienna CL, basically this, the iterative solvers are just basically um, added by extending the, the tag dispatching. Um, so conjugate gradients, spicy cheese step, um, jam rest. There's also well, preconditions, but we're not going to talk about that. Um, and yeah, as I said, these iterative solvers are not in Ublas, but since the interfaces are compatible, um, you can now basically mix the two. That means you take you basically take here the compressed matrix and vector out of Ublas, and you use the iterative solver implementations from the NLCL, and all of a sudden you have basically code exchange between something which was initially written for GPUs and something which is, well, just Ublas, so basically for, um, yeah, CPU execution. Um, but it's not just restricted to CPUs, uh, to, to Ublas. You can also do the same um, game with the Eigen library or MPL4. So you can throw in types from these libraries right into the solve function. Now you have the iterative solvers also for these other libraries. Okay, just to sort of convince you, um, this is basically taken from the CG implementation. Um, yeah, probably you don't know exactly what the, the various variables denote, but the point is, even even the implementation of iterative solver is just using um, the like high level um, operator overloads, no like dirty tricks. Um, there's a bit of generics over here, so the prod function makes sure that the correct matrix vector product routine is called. But everything else is basically yeah, just just take your favorite math textbooks on iterative solvers, grab the algorithms, and you can just directly compare. It makes debugging particularly. Um, convenient and simple. Okay, so now some quick facts about Vienna CL. Um, yeah, as I said, it's a high level C library for linear algebra. It um, has three backends at the moment. That means um, OpenMP for basically multi core CPU, um, OpenCL for, well, most GPUs out there. It has a CUDA backend because NVIDIA wants to have separate attention. Um, it's header only, so this addresses basically the portability thing. Just well, copy the source tree over to wherever you need it. And yeah, multi-platform, which means Windows, Mac OS, Linux. Um, now, okay, so it's free open source, MIT license, so feel free to do whatever you want with it. Sell it if you, if you want. Um, it's yeah, currently hosted at SourceForge with about 50 to 100 downloads per week. So it is, it is used out there. Um, and these design rules are actually, yeah, try to keep things 
simple, but give users the ability to basically specify and customize options if they want to. Um, try to stay compatible with Boost Ublas where possible. Of course, this is only possible where um, comparable functionality in Ublas is available. And the one thing which, which might sound a bit odd at first, if you think about GPU computing, is the um, we prefer clean design over performance. So the thing, however, is so far this was never an X or. So once we had a clean design, we could later on still go for the performance. So, which is even true in the GPU computing world. Okay, um, so now for some, yeah, basics. So we have, well, basic types, the scalar type, vector type, dense matrix type, a couple of compressed, um, sorry, sparse matrix type. And for data initialization, you can also do, well, same as you would do with standard host code. So instantiate the various vector types. Um, yeah, and then basically just write the values. And yeah, because, well, we all know, oh, so, so standard vector is basically, yeah, main memory, CPU, same for Ublas, and here we NSL, we have sort of GPU support. Of course, you would expect that um, here the third option is the fastest, right? So fast, consider here the poor tiny CPU with slow block counts, and here the monstrous GPU, which of course, it's way faster in the end. Um, no, it's not the case. There is something called latency, um, which leads to quite a, quite a bunch of headaches if you have small work items sending over. So here, if you have here this for loop, um, you would basically generate a random number and then send it over through PCI Express on the GPU memory and do this 100 times. But e each PCI Express transfer, of course, well, basically takes ages compared to here, just the single value comparison. So important thing here is you really need to, like, formulate your work uh, in larger items. Try to stay away from, like, fine granularity, which is dealing with elements, formulate all operations and objects. So um, operator overloads are very, very, um, important here because this allows you to basically just specify large work items which you then can send over to the GPU. Okay, so in particular, um, if you want to initialize values, usually you set up things here on the CPU, throw values in, and then um, you can use here the copy interface which is basically well, just designed along the ideas of the standard copy of a routine, and then, yeah, basically just iterate through the, the standard vector and send it over to the GPU. Same here. Um, you might wonder a bit, why, well, iterators basically just up from one element to another. Um, internally, this is basically a bit of a trick. Uh, internally, um, it just, yeah, sets up, it, it basically accumulates elements together and then does a batch copy. For matrices, well, copy, it's basically the same. Now, iterators are a bit harder here. So we just use um, basically a copy as you would do it on, on the terminal. So source and destination, and the way back. And something which I just want to mention here briefly, even though it probably deserves the whole talk on its own, is the iterator concept doesn't quite work on accelerators. Just because an iterator has some sort of inherent um, serial nature in the sense that if you have if you have um, well, something like a forward iterator, all you can do is basically hop from one element to another and then to another, but you don't have anything like parallelism in here. If you really want to have parallelism, then you would basically need a random access iterator. But well, a random access iterator is something which you can usually abstract in other ways. So iterator and GPUs don't match that well. Okay, so now a bit to the internals. So basically where, where the programming technique is um, basically buried in. Um, so consider vector to, uh, addition. So x equals y plus z for some vectors. So, well, I assume here everybody knows temporaries are expensive and we have techniques for that. Um, basically expression templates. So problem is, oh, you, on the, on the uh, CPU, you usually have something like this recursive unwrapping of the final 
assignment statement, which is a bit tricky on GPUs because um, CUDA code, well, can be dealt with there, but with OpenCL you don't have, for example, templates. So you sort of need to have either something which dynamically generates the kernel, or you just say up front, I, res I have a predefined set of kernels and I just map the various routines onto this predefined set. The current implementation in, uh, in Vienna CL is such that we have a predefined set of kernels. That means we prevent here the expression templates to expand for too large or to go uh, into uh, to be too deep. And we just basically truncate if, if the number of, of operations is too large. Then we say, okay, now we compute and then occasionally we accept temporaries. Um, for vector additions, basically it means that you, you can have here a plus, a plus statement. You can possibly multiply with scalars. This all works without temporaries. But if you have three or more add-ons, then a temporary is somewhere introduced. So that's the current implementation. Okay, so here is A, B, B, V. This is basically A times Y plus B times Z. Um, quick look into that. Um, what it does basically first is, is it dispatches with respect to the memory domain. So the memory domain is a runtime parameter. And then, yeah, depending on where the data resides, it either calls well, host based, so basically the OpenMB version, or the OpenCL kernel, or the underlying CUDA kernel. Um, it's, well, as I said, since the um, uh, memory domain is a runtime parameter, you can also like migrate buffers back and forth. For example, um, you might have some vector on the CPU, uh, on the GPU, and then you want to do some serial action on it, which is terribly inefficient on the GPU. So you want to copy it back to the CPU, which is basically here the switch memory domain. Then you can basically access the data in main RAM do the serial part here, and then switch it back. So that's all supported. It's pretty much um, transparent to users. So this is usually somewhere in preconditioners. Um, usually the user doesn't see it, but if the user wants, you can also do the same thing. OK, so probably I spent a slide on compute kernel. Um, I don't know. What's the familiarity with OpenCL or CUDA? here in the audience? At least heard a bit? Heard a bit, good. Um, we don't need more than this. Um, OK, so consider yeah, the vector addition example. So usually what you would do is basically pass the three memory buffers, or look at some information on the size. And then here you have here this basically thread ID thing. And then you add things up. OK. So of course, in the NACL with like um, a library supporting also sub vectors and slices of vectors. Um, well, you probably you don't want to have too many kernels because each of them stresses the just the time compiler additionally. So you basically want to have quite a number of functionality within the same kernel. So here, for example, this kernel we can easily generalize in the sense that we allow offsets. So we we don't necessarily need to start with index zero in all the buffers. We can um, OK, sorry, forgot the Kalers. Um, so, well, just alpha and beta. Um, and for the offsets, you can now basically add parameters offset x, offset y, offset z. So, basically, add some few parameters. And yeah, thinking of strides, you might have an increment, which is not just basically one, but you might have, you might jump from index two to index four to index six, and so forth. And so um, it's all an increment here. And now this kernel, this kernel, even though it's basically, as written here, flops are for free. So these index computations, you don't see this in the um, execution. Um, now this kernel, it's still just one kernel, but it can be applied to a far larger range of operations. And th yeah, the thing is, on NVIDIA GPUs, you really don't see any performance difference. Um, what we found out, out after we applied it is that um, the Intel Mic and the AMD um, GPUs, they are doing some tricks with respect to vector types here. So um, there you pay a bit of performance, but it's usually something in the acceptable range of, well, no more than a factor of two, but 
Still, two, two is a lot in GPU computing, but they're acceptable. But you have, you have strategies, strategies to tackle this. OK, so a bit of benchmarks, because well, in computational science, people are also interested in benchmarks. So um, let's, look, let's look at the vector addition example here. So on the CPU, this is well, basically just the naive implementation. We get a pretty linear scaling throughout the vector size range. So starting with something like 16 entries up to like 10 millions, it's just linear. Of course, assuming that the cache was empty previously, things like that. Um, if you then move on to OpenMP, then you see, ah, OK, well, you get a bit of benefit because you saturate the memory channels fully usually, but then you also have the slight, of, uh, slight overhead at smaller vector sizes because the thread launch is expensive. OK, but now let's move on to accelerators. So um, let's start with Intel Mic. If you run things natively on the Intel Mic, then, well, you see a pretty similar picture. So in the small vector size regime, you have also a bit of an overhead. Then, OK, here it is an artifact. But um, yeah, for the large vector sizes, you then have the memory bandwidth, which kicks in. So you get, well, there is a factor of four five, six in, perfor uh, in, in performance, which is pretty much the higher memory band, which you get. OK, so now you can't run everything on the X uh, Xeon Phi natively because, well, it is an accelerated arch architecture, so it has crappy single core performance. Um, so if, you're, if you use the Xeon Phi in an accelerator setting, like run you on your host and then just basically send over workload, then, yeah, with OpenCL, you see, oops. <laughs> We have tremendous overhead for small vector sizes. Tremendous means basically up to sizes of uh, somewhere in the range of well, 200,000 elements. You don't see any gain over the over the CPU at all. So here is really late latency that kills you. Okay, so at the time we conducted this benchmark, the OpenCL implementation was fairly new for the Qn5. So of course we could say, well, it's still improving, um, which is which just yeah, took an early version and was it beta hardware also. So probably it was just a software stack which needs, needed to mature. So let's move on to AMT GPU. So on the Radeon 7970, you still get well, pretty, uh, pretty, pretty much the same picture. So latency is a bit smaller. But again, well, unless you're somewhere here in the regime of 40,000 entries, you don't get any benefit of the CPU at all. And only here at, yeah, about a million entries, you finally get the benefit which you observe or which you want to have, which also means, well, we really need the large data, but large data is a problem on GPUs because they have limited memory. So the sweet spot is fairly small here, actually. OK, so moving to NVIDIA. Um, yeah, you see they have a fairly better implementation with respect to latency for OpenCL. Um, and then, well, if you move from OpenCL to CUDA, you even see, ah, OK, here is where they spend their effort in. So here the latency is considerably better. But still, they have quite a hard time to get anything competitive um, with a CPU implementation. So again, even with CUDA, you need something like, well, let's say at least 10,000 entries to have anything going. OK. so. Um, well, the same game can, can be played now for iterative solvers. Um, so this is now really a solver, not just a little vector iteration, uh, vector addition. But yeah, it basically uses the same set of operations. So you, you get the same picture, linear scaling on the CPU, then, well, on the phi, Xeon Phi, then some latency issues. Um, on the AMD GPU, your know, latency gets even harder. Um, OpenCL on, on NVIDIA is doing a bit better. And then with CUDA, the latency is somewhat acceptable. But the turning point is always here in the regime of something like 100,000 unknowns in the linear system. And for the AMD case, you even want to have something like over a million unknowns, which is fairly large. OK, but uh, we're not going to get too much into the details, because usually you also want preconditioners. Let's keep that for now. So if you have a question. Oh, the, pre the previous one was just a single operation, yes. Yeah, 
Um, so for the vector distribution here, sorry for the microphone. So the, f the question was, um, here for the vector addition example is the, the overhead we see is this data transfer. Um, answer is no, here the data is already on the GPU. So this, in, this is basically kernel launch overhead, overhead. It basically means at the time you enqueue the operation, you know, of course the like, main process needs to communicate over to the um, GPU and say, please need, uh, run this and that kernel on the GPU. Um, yeah, and t just just this message passing, so to say, is something in the range of 10 microseconds, which amounts to something like 10,000 CPU cycles. And 10,000 10, CPU cycles, it's pretty much here. So it's it's not a coincidence that the turning point is about here. Um, not really. So this was actually averaged over. 10 or 20 runs. So basically it was 10 or 20 operations enqueued one after another already. And then, and then, um, yeah, and then taking the average basically. And the same is for the CG iteration. So here, there is, it's not that we're waiting for the kernel to, to complete until we enqueue the next one. So there is already an overlap. But it's just that the data, the amount of data needs to be large enough to really compensate for this overhead. Keep in mind that GPUs are like really fast. So it means once they run, well, they're pretty fast in doing the computation. So, well, sending the message over is getting even more expensive. Okay, Any more questions? No. Um, so then we also have these, well, the matrix matrix multiplication benchmark, which is just great for GPUs because it ignores all problems with latencies and it's so flop intensive, you can always like just make your cache large enough and you get close to peak. Um, so we played also with that. And so here, just for example, on the AMD GPU, uh, on AMD GPU so the HD7970, um, we played a bit with auto tuning. So you, we basically just came up with various ways of writing the Matrix, matrix multiplication. And yeah, what we basically have in our release candidate for the upcoming release is something which is close to two teraflops. So we can do that. Um, however, one important point which, uh, which I think is particularly interesting to the community here is um, my message is expression templates are not enough for GPUs. So why? Um, Consider here these two vector operations. So u equals x plus y, v equals x minus y. So the one thing, of course, if you have here two kernel launches is latency. But there is another problem involved. Um, if, so consider now basically the flow of data. So you have the two vectors x and y, which you load into, well, basically cache, and then they, they move over to the ALU, and then um, well, it's not, not depicted, but then the result is somehow written back. Okay, so this starts here with the first entry. And then moving, uh, iterating through the vectors. At some point, you read some other data, um, move to some other place in cache, send it again to the ALU, and store the result back. Okay. But as you move through the vector, basically, um, at some point, you will just run out of cache, so nothing stays in here. If you go to for large vector sizes, there is no data which can be re reused for the second operation. And the expression templates are just about that, optimizing the execution for one line of code. So what we have in the NSL currently is a kernel generator. Um, basically, we should say we want to have a kernel generated for the operations u, u equals x plus y and the operation v equals x minus y. And then we have, so basically this ties these two operations together. And then we have here this op, op execute. So just, uh, just for the sake of completeness, so the types of u and v and x, y are not exactly the same as here right now. But what is work in progress is that the user really just writes 
here this line of code using standard operator overloads. And then there is basically a scheduler sitting in the back which fuses kernels together. So it's really like something which is keeping track of the data at runtime and then tying them together, running pieces of code. So does this make sense? It's always the question. Um, so here, not a benchmark plot. Yes, it does make sense for large data. And large data is what we are usually concerned of, uh, concerned about in this whole sober business thing. So consider first the blue lines. So this is now Intel MKL, so the dotted thing. And um, here this is the OpenCL implementation. I don't know, the, here was some artifacts. So usually this should be far, far on, on the left. But anyway, so as the vector sizes increase, then here we beat, we easily beat um, MKL for the operation, so dot product of 2x plus y with x. So here, some re, uh, here, here x can be reused. And that's actually what is inside our kernel. And here we have this um, basically factor of 2 where we beat the MKL. But the same holds true here on the green line for Kubla, so on the NVIDIA GPU. And the red line is AMD, so basically the NSL. Here we even have better implementation of the inner product, so dot product, where we have a factor of almost four over the AMD CL plus. So this is something, considering that we are facing this memory wall, um, something that is very important for the future. So expression templates are really just too limited because you have this one line of code where you can destroy that, but you want to have more context to optimize. Okay, um, any questions on the Vienna CL part so far? Any more questions? No. Okay, so if not, we move on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Scared of the math. So the NSCL is now part of, or there are bindings in Patsy, so the Silver Package Patsy. And there, basically, Patsy provides the uh, scaling to, like, yeah, whatever cluster you want. And then for one process, you can then have, basically, the NSCL taking care of the, um, yeah, accelerators. So that is available. But there is nothing MPI specific in the NSCL currently. Um, okay, so. First, the question was, um, the, no, the previous question was whether there's anything MPI related to uh, in the NSCL. Um, the, the answer I gave already. So now the question is um, regarding debug tools. So um, you can basically run all the NSCL code in the like debuggers provided by the manufacturers. So AMD has profilers uh, and debuggers. Um, CUDA has even their own, what is it, CUDA? DB, the CUDA debugger you can also run things there. And you can you basically get the full support for that. And the other thing is um, because there is interface compatibility with Ublas, you can always just yeah run the Ublas comparison against it, which also helps. It's not a perfect debugging solution, but it's still a high-level debugger which gives you some information about is this part of the code executing correctly. Okay, we have another question. Um, so the question is whether there's going to be any preconditioning uh, here. So no, not in this talk, because I decided um, that's probably too specialized for the audience here. Okay, let's move on. So now, second part, we're in a grid. So just in case you forgot the big picture, the big picture. So we're now considering here the, the mesh handling. So it's a bit, a bit, well, shift of shift of uh, concerns, but um, still there's quite some math involved. So yeah, again, let's look at boost first. What do we have in boost? In boost, we have boost geometry, which is nice in the sense that you have some primitives like yeah, throw throw a couple of points or lines. Uh, so some ge geometric primitives at it, and then you can at least use things like distance. That's nice. However, what boost geometry does not provide is um, 
this topologic information. Like, I have a triangle and I want to have the vertices. I want to have the edges. Well, probably for triangles, it, it still works because, well, this can be sort of mapped into the line stream thing. But for tetrahedra, there is nothing which can be well, reused from boost geometry. There's also, well, not really anything for hexahedra. Um, yeah, as I said, traversal of boundary elements. I want, to, I, want to have, I want to iterate over the faces of a tetrahedron. Well, nothing in there. And also, what if you, ha what if you have millions of triangles, for example? There is no, well, boost geometry doesn't help you here. But yeah, when a grid will do, as we can see. Um, but just we, first of all, we need a bit of, yeah, what are we talking about? Formalized things, abstract things. So this, the main abstraction in Vienna Grid is the concept of an N cell. So the N refers basically to, to something like, oh, to the topological um, dimension. So think of something which has topological dimension zero as points, or vertices as we usually call it. Something of topological dimension one is then a line, basically something which, where you have just one parameter in order to get from basically this one vertex um, to the other one. Okay, so line. Well, you we basically know what a line is. Yeah, moving on to um, topological dimension two. Now, you can consider a triangle to be something which is of topological dimension two, but it, it is also um, a quadrilateral which has topological dimension two. Something which you can basically per, uh, parameterize with um, two parameters. Um, but you can basically move on. So here's tetrahed a tetrahedron um, is topological dimension three, and so on and so forth. You could, you could basically, you could talk about an eight-dimensional cell, but I have some problems imagining that in my head, so we basically stop here at dimension three. But the point, important part here is we are not saying anything about the geometric space where the thing is embedded. So this triangle might lie somewhere arbitrarily in the three-dimensional uh, three space. So um, it might also have some weird coordinate system. Um, it's not the usual like Cartesian co coordinate system. It might also have something like spherical coordinate system, whatever. Um, the topological information, though, remains completely unaffected from the geometry. So we split these two concerns completely. Okay, then also thinking about like the mesh, if you have many of these objects, then it's also a matter of a question of where do you store what. So if you have, of course, what do you actually store? So in simple terms, if you just have a triangle, then you might consider, say, say, oh, okay, um, some, somewhere I have my vertex array, so I store all the vertices, and somewhere else there is the cell array. So cell here is basically the triangle, and I have basically all the triangles lined up, and each of the triangles has basically pointers to the global vertices. You may, however, also want to store the edges, which makes perfect, perfect sense for some algorithms, while for others it just doesn't matter at all. And if you go one dimension f uh, higher, tetrahedrons, then you have also the faces which you may want to store, which you may not want to store. And of course, if you just have one way of dealing with these requirements, well, you probably will you probably want, uh, you will probably provide something which is not the ideal solution for a particular application. So to give you some numbers, so this is now the three-dimensional case, vertices, uh, tetrahedra. So assuming we have 24,000 tetrahedra, which are somehow forming a mesh, and where you have all the facets and edges and vertices stored. So basically you have all these pointers in each of the tetrahedra. If you then basically s yeah, sum up the memory requirements, you see that Okay, you would need something like five megabytes of main RAM to do so. If, however, um, you know that you will never ever need the edges and the facets, then, well, you don't need to store anything. You can basically throw away all the um, pointers you would usually have in the object. And, well, you just need a fraction of the memory, so one-eighth approximately. And one-eighth is a lot in computational science. Or factor of eight is a lot in computational science. 
So the important concept here is we have a completely configurable data storage scheme. So you can you have fine grained control over what you store where in the NI grid. Um, so how does this work? Basically here this element T, the element type, is what represents an N cell. And depending on its topological dimension, it might it has several lower layers. So think, think of it as, okay, we start here with the tetrahedron, then okay, somewhere attach an ID, and then here we have the face sets, we have the um, the lines, so the edges, and we have the vertices. And well, this also extends to higher dimensions if needed. And in code, this well recursive scheme pretty much translates to a recursive inheritance. So you basically say my n cells or three cell might be simplex. Um, basically inherits from the boundary layer taking care of the triangles, which itself inherits from the um, boundary layer taking care of edges and so on and so forth until you hit the vertex layer. And then there is also an ID handler because for some reasons, which I'm probably not going too far into, you also want to have an, a way to say, this is my vertex number five, or my, um, this is my, my triangle number seven. So there's also this ID option. Okay, so that's pretty much how the how the uh, class structure gets set up. Um, now the question is, how do you configure all that? Because well, if you have lots of options, you somehow need to specify what you're going to do. So um, basically, there is a config object. So you basically have here something like convenience triangular 3D, where you have a couple of tags. So you say um, my underlying numeric type is double. This is pretty much standard. Um, then I want to have a Cartesian coordinate system in three dimensions. So I'm somewhere in R3, so to say. But my cell type, so the sort of highest topological thing I have, should be a triangle. So this would be a common description for something like a hull mesh. And yeah, once you have here this config set up, you then basically um, just say my domain, so the domain is basically what you would consider a mesh, um, is basically derived here from this triangular thing. There's also a few more other tweaks um, where you basically just say for this config I want to have no edges stored, which are basically um, provided by sort of generic overloads, so some meta functions for which you provide overloads and say, oh, for triangular 3D I don't want to have edges stored. So this basically supplements the configuration. What is currently work in progress, though, is to have everything, the full specification here in this configuration struct, uh, struct which pretty much gets involved because you have to deal with the recursive nature. Um, but if you, if you don't have everything within one config thing, then you have some issues with various compilation units if the type appears to be the same even though you have some other overloads which may not be the same across the compilation unit. So this is for the implementation detail. Okay, so how does the traversal now look like? Um, no, we, want to we want to provide something which still feels like C++ and, well, on the other hand, is efficient in the sense that um, consider you want to iterate over the vertices of a, of a triangle. We know, well, a vertex has three uh, triangle has three vertices. So that means this, these are all tight loops. And well, of course you want to, ha to give the compiler the chance to unroll the whole thing. Um, so well, the standard basically STL kind of approach would be, um, well, you basically you iterate just begin and you have the iterators. Um, another question is, well, how do you, um, how do you basically get your iterator out. Uh, basically, how do you specify I want to have my vertices from the domain? For that, we reuse the range concept, so something you also find in Boost. So this is something where you can iterate over, but it doesn't like, uh, but it's not a container in the sense that it stores elements. So here, um, the vertex range is just instantiated by give me all n cells of topological dimension zero from the domain. And then, well, here are some meta functions for getting the appropriate types. You might notice that, um, so 
here there's a slight duplication of the parameter zero. So here for the vertex range, you need to specify that you want uh, vertices. And then here for the n-size function, again, you, well, another zero. So one of them is redundant. And for that, actually, this one is optional. Um, but still, you, you might want to have it here because, as I said, if the iterator is too hard for the compiler to optimize away, then um, you can write something like an index-based for loop. You can say, oh, start from i equals to 0, go up until, OK, here this is the range. Go, um, well, iterate until you reach the size of the um, range, and well, increment as usual. And here, for example, you can just nicely put an open MPE pragma if you want to. And on the other hand, if you here, for example, have vertices of a triangle, then this dot size is derived um, at compile time from the configuration. So we know this is number three. Uh, so this is three at compile time. And here now the compiler can nicely just unroll it if needed. OK, so this is basically providing high-level interface and still giving the compiler the chance to optimize things away. OK, then there is also something which is a bit trickier, which is co-bounder iteration. So assume you have this not, well, not, not superbly nice mesh, and you're sitting here on this vertex. So the data structure is set up such that you go from basically higher dimension to lower dimension. So basically, from a triangle, you go to edges, you get to vertices. But well, if you want to do the other way around, so you want from this vertex to iterate of all the cells, um, then you need additional, a bit of additional information. Um, for example, consider, consider the whole thing is here basically cut in two, then you might just want to iterate over the left half of the, of the um, domain. So there is, there is segment support for that. But anyway, so the thing is you need to have information about the enclosing elements. So if you want to, want to iterate over all the triangles, which are basically here um, topologically, a topological dimension two of a vertex, then you also need the enclosing container context, so to say, so that you re grab the correct um, triangles. Okay, and you know, everything else is just the same. So here you have again the iterator. You can also write um, an index-based loop if you want. But of course, here um, for the index-based loop, there is no static information about the number of triangles because this is not known at compile time. So this cannot be optimized. OK, there are other features in Vienna Grid which probably go too much into detail. I just want to mention briefly. So things like segments. This is basically, if you have here this brick thing, then this could be one segment. Here the connection could be a second segment. And here is a third segment. Um, there is support for that. There is also well, I.O., reading, writing uh, meshes, um, commuting more and more information, which is interesting for fine volume schemes, and also refinement which is actually applied here. So here, this connection here was refined. Um, and then there's also other things like um, piecewise linear complexes, hybrid meshes, um, multigrids. But this is basically work in progress. It's not yet in the release. OK, so that's for Vienna Grid. Any questions on that? Um, you can have both, um, but it depends on what you want to do at the interface. Um, yes, the question was: <laughs> the question was, if you have multiple segments, what's well, what are the requirements on the interface? So, if you want, if you want to basically transfer information, or if you want, if you need connectivity information from one segment to another, then they need to be aligned. That's in the current implementation. Even though if you don't need to have any, basically, transfer of information, then they can just touch, but then the vertices would be duplicated, things like that. OK, any other question? Yes. So the question was, do we support higher order elements? Um, the answer is, 
not in not in Vienna grid because it does not appear to be the right place to put this information in. So if you have the topological information of the triangle, well, higher order element doesn't quite fit there. If you just have the geometry, basically, so the location of the vertices doesn't also fit there. Um, so we don't have anything in the grid. What we would do is, we see this at the end of the talk, is um, have the higher order information at sitting at some higher um, point in the, in the software stack. Okay, any other question? No. Okay, so let's move on to Vienna data. So, well, how do we how do we store all the quantities on um, the mesh? So let's consider a naive approach first. Um, assuming you have some triangle class and then you want to add data to it. So usually, well, you would have basically the three vertices, points, whatever you call it. Then you might have application specific data like is this a boundary triangle or row which might be something like specific mass or whatever you have for your particular application well probably I don't need to explain a lot that well it's not really what you want to do because now each of the triangles carries a boolean flag even if you well just have 10 out of 1 million triangles sitting on a boundary. Um, also, the row here is quite a problem because you no longer have just a triangle, but you now have something which, which should better be named triangle with material information. So calling this tri triangle is, even though it's still pretty, well, you find computational science codes which do these kind of things, but um, it's just hoping that it abstracts more than it does. So conclusion is this leads to monolithic code. You cannot reuse the triangle somewhere else. Don't do it. Okay, so thinking about here, for example, the boundary flag, you might think, oh, the triangle is not the right place. I put this somewhere in the mesh. So now I have here, well, for example, a vector of triangles. So here I have all triangles sitting. And then, well, now I have something like a map, which basically just tells me where the where the boundary triangles are. And for my material quantity, I just, yeah, here now I have a vector because, well, each of the triangles should have this material property, which I call row for triangles. So it's a bit better because, well, here the boundary map is a bit more efficient with respect to memory. Um, but still, it suffers from some problems regarding, well, this row for triangles thing is still application specific. And you also have to to pass the mesh object around even though you're just probably operating on a triangle. So basically the data is, well, not sitting at the right spot again. And also, again, it leads to monolithic code because this would be better a mesh with material properties for a specific mass rather than a mesh. So this is now one of the key problems we are facing with Vienna grids and where we thought a lot about. How can we get, basically, how can we make Vienna grid completely reusable for different contexts uh, context without, um, yeah, having the problem of data storage? And the approach in Vienna grid is now, well, we just store the data essentially independently of the mesh. So let's just, well, let's look at the code. Probably that's what we can, what, what we can all do best here. So what's the interface? So we have a free function access. And um, now think of a standard map. What you usually need is a key type and a value type. And here it's basically the same for Vienna data. You just say, I have some key which provides me access to some data, and the data is stored for an object. So what you can do now is say, um, for the boundary flags, you say, well, I have some boundary key type. I'm not specifying further what it is. The data type should be a bool. Uh, a bool. So just saying, is it on the boundary, yes or no? Then, well, here you provide some key for the object triangle. <coughs> this gives you well, is the, the information about whether this um, triangle is on the boundary. And the same you can do for the specific mass. Okay, now, use a mass key type. And, well, 
looking at the pros and cons. So if we have some, some triangle and mesh class, now these are perfectly reusable because they don't interfe interfere with the application-specific data. Um, we can also use this approach with, with um, data types where we don't have um, the possibility to modify the source code. So if this triangle thing is something where, where, which might be even closed source, um, we can still basically associate data with it. And also it's a unified interface. So even though basically here this is some sparse data or this is dense data, um, it's the same interface. The only drawback we have, which is some, somehow acceptable for computational science, but still is something we, keep, uh, we want to address in future releases, is that it has some sort of global state, which you see in the next slide. So the interface again, success with the key type, value type, key for an object. Um, if we know nothing about what object is, uh, what object is, then the only information we have is, um, well, an address. So internally, what is happening down here is there is somewhere some um, singleton map sitting, which is basically stores the pointer to the object, and then in order to basically grab the right data with respect to key type and the key, there is another map of well, key type value type. So it's basically two nested standard maps. And that's pretty much well, the best thing we can do if we know nothing else about the object. Um, now, considering that well, these are all type dispatches, um, if you have here a couple of very success functions, then for each of the type triplets, so object type, key type, value type, we get a separate um, stun, uh, nested map for that. So they are generated by the compiler. And just those which are actually used in code are generated by the compiler. OK, so looking at performance considerations, if we have n triangles and k, key, uh, k so capital K keys of the same type, then excess times is something like order log n plus log k. So logarithmic success, which is, well, not too bad, but for high performance, while well, you're jumping around the memory, it's still not ideal. So you want, want, you want to do better, but the question is, can we do better? In general, no. Well, if you have, at least I'm not aware of anything which is faster than log n access on a, on a map. So probably something has changed in the last couple of minutes, but I don't think so. But still, if we have some additional knowledge, we can do better. So what is this additional knowledge now? Um, let's start with the key. So if we, so basically, let's first address the lock, lock k access time here. If we know we just have one data item for each key type, then we can get rid of the second map. So if we have here something like a mask key, might be some tag. And then here's some object which basically doesn't carry data, which is just, well, which doesn't matter, so you can just skip it. Then basically, well, you got rid of the map. So the internal data structure is now just a standard map, the object type, and the value type. So the key type, the key type, which is basically here the mask key, is used for dispatching into the correct map by the compiler. And again, the interface here is transparent to the user. Oh, so what is going on here in the storage scheme doesn't affect here the calling sequence. And yeah, if you want to enable this type-based key dispatch, this is just basically one line of code which you well, just specify, please, for mask key, use, um, use just the type key dispatch. So that's the first logarithmic access time. So we still have this log n access time, which is usually the one which hurts because you might have lots of triangles in your mesh. Well, we can do better if, um, yes, if we provide numeric IDs for objects. This is probably if you recall, we had this ID thing which we could add in the you know, grid for the elements. And here now this can be used for data access. So if we, um, if we know that here the triangle basically provides an ID, so we can provide a generic function for that, then, well, we can just use a standard vector for the value type. And here we have O of 1 access. 
So now we are fine. So basically, this is now the fastest access which you, you can reasonably get. And usually, considering the typical, typical application, you have one mesh loaded where the elements are just numbered from 0 to n minus 1, basically. And again, the interface is unchanged. And um, well, you just need to overload the generic ID function for that. OK, so let's consider a benchmark on that. So um, our reference is some class which is called lightweight, which basically is just think of it as a triangle which just carries its three um, vertices or pointers to its vertices. So something which has basically just a few bytes of size. And then we compare here with what we call fat class, um, which has different payloads, so which might range from something like 10 bytes to 1,000 bytes. And even a thousand bytes, probably not much. So considering that the double has already eight bytes. So, so if you basically attach all your your material data into a triangle using the monolithic approach, then you easily get here something in the order of a thousand, a thousand bytes a size, um, per object. Okay, so what's the benchmark? If we just have ten to the three objects, so something which basically fits into cache. Then um, we see if we just directly access the data member here in the FAT class, then, well, it's about a factor of three faster. And as it gets larger, it's still faster than the Vena data access. But, well, the difference is still reasonable in the sense that the factor of two is something which you're willing to pay for the large amount of your, your reusability you have. But if things no longer fit into cache, so if you're somewhere in the 10 to the 6 object range, then all of a sudden, well, the FAT class, so with just a little bit of payload and direct access to the data member, it's still a bit faster than the Vienna um, data approach. But as soon as there is a bit more data coming in, so as soon as there is more material property, so to say, um, the Vienna data approach is better because it's just tighter in memory. You have um, better cache, um, you have better, better cache reuse because all the data you access is just yeah, locate it together or stick together into memory. So basically, you don't pay anything in performance, but you still have this huge benefit of not creating monolithic code. OK, so that's for the data handling. Um, any questions on that? Oh, so I think, oh there's another slide, yes. A um, couple of other routines which I'm not going to talk about. So for data, Handling, you also want to basically copy data. You want to move it from one object to another, check whether data is stored for a sparse case, and also erase. There are a couple of details here, but considering the time is flying, I well, we don't want to go into details here. OK, any questions? Question here. Um, so the question is, um, if I have a sparse data, and that, but I use the vector, um, whether, well, of course, whether this, well, let's, pro let's put it this way, whether it's the correct, or whether there's a better way to keeping the sparse um, nature of the thing. Um, for that case, if you have so the answer, um, the ID accessor, you can, there are two things. So the one thing is providing the generic way of, of accessing an ID for an object. And the other thing is basically enabling the vector instead of the map. So these are actually two things. You can provide an ID, but still use the map for that, which you would do for the sparse data. Oh, probably you just stay with pointers and don't provide the ID at all. Okay, so the comment question, uh, it's my comment. 
is that, um, yeah, in his experience, uh, the amount of sparse data you have is basically negligible compared to the number of different dense data, ob uh, well, data objects you have. So it doesn't really matter if you just store things straight away. And um, yeah, basically, I, I share this experience. So usually, you really don't need to care about the data. But the thing is, um, we don't want to like. We don't want to project our typical use cases into the library. So we still want to basically provide the um, possibility for users who just deal with sparse data to also have proper access mechanisms. But yeah, for the computational science, usually you don't have to worry about sparse data. At least in the context of mesh and linear systems also. Okay. Then move on. So the end of math. Um, so now it's about here the scary thing, the PDEs, the dealing with that in code. Um, I try, well, of course I try not to overdo it here, but I give you a bit of an idea of what's provided. So um, yeah, what the end of math provided, uh, provides is, well, you can basically symbolically evaluate and manipulate math expressions. Think of it as well, things you can do with lambdas, but in a math setting. Um, yeah, you can also do things like um, runtime, compile time interface, uh, so unified differentiation and integration provided. So think about, so for those of you who know Mathematica or Maple, think about it as sort of the, the very, very tiny little equivalent, but now natively within C++. Um, sample usage. So you can declare variables x, y, and z. So you specify basically. Um, so if you pro, if you pass some array to it, you specify the index location, so x, y, z. So basically accessing the first element of some vector, uh, yeah, first, second, third, um, and then you can basically provide random expressions. So you can tie them together. So this is not a runtime way. You can say x plus y minus z. This is my new expression f. You can also do the same for G, just say F times F on the new expression. Well, and if you want to evaluate it, you can say, ah, oh, here, take my expression F, this guy here, and I want to evaluate that for values 1, 2, and 4. So X equals 1, Y equals 2, Z equals 4. And what you get, well, you should get minus 1. Well, you do get minus 1. And in uh, lowercase, ah, oh, yeah, here's a bug. Um, you get plus one instead of plus four. So this is now the runtime interface. So runtime, because we don't have anything like an output keyword in C++ uh, plus plus 98, so in order to store here expressions in something else, here we have this runtime attribute. But we, you can also do the same thing in compile time. Um, you declare now a compile time variable, basically doing the same thing, but now the parameter moves to template argument. Again, x, y, z. I have a couple of constants. And then for the evaluation, you can just form, you cannot no longer store um, your expression explicitly unless you use the auto keyword in C11. And you have x plus y minus z. And then here you have, again, the make vector. But now you provide compile time constants. Here you get, again, the same number minus 1. And we have a question. Oh, the set. Yeah. No, that's a typo. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> that should be a two. So, okay. Okay. no, it no, <laughs> would, would be nonsense. Um, yeah. Sorry for that. And the question was whether here the um, set here is what well, typo? And yes, it is a typo. It should be two. Okay. So once you have basically the basic machinery going, so well, the implementation itself is nothing but basically syntax trees. So um, it's just basically the standard way of, ha of well, do it the same way you deal with lambdas, basically. Um, yeah, now you can do some more stuff. You can start substituting x for y in this expression. You can differentiate x times y plus z with respect to x, so on and so forth. Um, this would be the runtime interface. 
compile, compile, for the compile time case, you basically just need to exchange the types here. And it's the same interface. Well, this is neat, but it's still fairly simple. Let's do some more complicated things. Um, integration. So numerical integration here. In the runtime, you spe uh, first specify the integral. So here, basically, well, just the equivalent, basically, pretty, pretty much how you would write it in LaTeX. Then you can you instantiate a Gaussian quadrature rule. Then you run your integrator on f. So f is now basically your expression. It's one way, or you can basically um, launch the integrator by basically inlining or by providing the integration domain, the integrand, and the integration variable as the three arguments. And you can also do the same with compile time. But well, let's make it a bit harder. We Let's even consider nested integration. Well, interface is the same, essentially. Um, so here we have now a function, integrate, specify the interval, integrand variable. And well, if you nest this, well, we get something like 1 over 24 for here is more complicated integral. So it's all what Vienna Math can provide you. Um, and then everything. You get here one over twenty-four in the in the executable. So, if the compiler is smart, and here it even performs this division, but better not to rely on that. And of course, the other thing is everything needs to be compiled and available. So, if you provide some interval which is only available at runtime, well, there's nothing that can be computed at compile time then. OK, and then you can also go further into function symbols. So you can specify, for example, so here this is my function symbol, so some unknown u. And then you can you also have some differential operators like Laplace u. Wrap that in an equation, so Laplace u equals 1. Or well, you can also do the same game with integrals. So for those of you who are familiar with finite elements, they will immediately see how these two lines are related. For those of you who aren't, don't worry about it because we just move on to the NFM. We have just a few more minutes, but we don't have that much to look in the NFM because this is now where the math is really pushing hard on your brain. So I try not to torture you too much, but to give you an idea why, why all this library stuff was done previously and why I was talking about it. So now it's, right here, uh, now it's really about merging the continuous with the discrete. So yeah, this is now kind of shaky if, you, if you're if you not familiar with fine element methods. But just yeah, get the big idea of what, what, what we are pursuing, what our ideas are. So the NFM is now basically built on top of the other four libraries, which I've presented already. Um, yeah, we have self in a solver, even though well, that can be exchanged. And then we have data for data storage. We have a grid for the mesh handling. And then we have a math for symbolic math. Okay, so. So far, so modular. Um, it also addresses, important point for us, the come and go in academia. So if we, have, if we want somebody to contribute to a finite element package, we no longer need this guy to be aware of all the details. It's enough if the guy just, um, OK, let's probably here pick Vienna math. If, the, if that guy knows how to do symbolic math in C++, it, he or she can still contribute nicely to Vienna FM without knowing anything about finite element methods. So that's basically the big picture of why we really want to decompose things. OK, so let's now put things together. Um, so for the mesh handling part, when a grid provides a reader, so we, provide, we read some mesh. Now with Vena math, we do the specification of the PDE. So make equation Laplace u equals minus 1, where you would write it here. And then the NFM now basically provides the glue and does the assembly of the linear system. So we, for simplicity, we assume you have a linear system. So what's going on basically is you have this PDE assembler object. And you just say, please assemble, namely assemble my Poisson equation with unknown u on my domain, which is here the mesh, and assemble that into system matrix and load vector. So this, these are basically the matrix and the vector for the linear system. And everything else is then derived internally. 
because the specification is complete. We know here, here we, from the domain type, we know the dimension we're in, which elements are there. We know the equation, and everything's here. And then, well, once the system is ready, well, it's just solved. Um, what you then get in the end is here the simulation output. So, pretty much, so considering that I started late, please allow for one minute because I want to show you one really cool thing, which is not on the slides. Namely, the NFM has something like a logger. But um, the logger, considering, oh, keeping in mind that Vienna Math provides LaTeX output, is actually a LaTeX document. And if you run one of the EVNFM examples, this is what you get. Basically, you get the tech file, but once you feed it through a LaTeX processor, VNFM just gives you that. So it tells you we started here with this um, PDE. It then says, oh, I need to, in, I need to derive a weak formulation. VNFM math derives a weak formulation, an integral formulation on that. It tells you, oh, I am in a two-dimensional simulation domain. So my gradients need to be dimensional things. So I have derivatives with respect to the two coordinates. Then moving on, finite element. So here we have here we have linear finite elements. So it tells you so I can hold that now. Um, it tells you basically, well, here is my ansatz, uh, trial space, ansatz space. Don't worry about it if you haven't heard about it before. Um, and if we transform to a local reference element, then here is the chain rule for the transformation. And it also provides you full information about the basis used. Usually, you have no chance getting this out of any like traditional finite element code. Just because this is never somehow represented in code. Okay, so much for the protocol. So, we're basically done. Um, just saying, you can play the game further, you can do the same thing for more complicated stuff like linear elasticity, so you really have like tensors of um, unknowns, so vector unknowns, Basically, just again specify this one line of code, and everything else is done internally. So you also get some nice pictures out of it. Um, if you want to know more about finite elements, there's also a talk on Friday um, morning by Bart Jensen's. Um That's you. Okay, I wasn't. Sh I had no idea who it is. So yes, you will provide more information on finite elements, yeah, um, which is fine. Um, just, yeah, basically the idea is one can do a lot more with providing high-level formulations. So, yeah, some recommendations, more finite elements on Friday to come. And, yeah, that's pretty much it. So just a short summary on what I was talking about. And if you have any more questions, please go ahead. Otherwise, thank you for your attention. Um, so the question was whether I've done any, uh, any comparison, for example, with Trinilinos for the Poisson problem. Um, actually, there was a paper published two or three years ago where basically all the ideas were already inside it. So um, the, whole, the whole elements, the local elements, they were all evaluated at compile time. And I found that, um, so the result in that paper was that the assembly was um, fastest among the packages compared. So it was faster than Sundance in most of the cases, and it was fa faster than all the other packages around, just because everything was available at compile time, and the compiler could further optimize things. But on the other hand, you also have to keep in mind that usually the bottleneck is not the assembly itself. Yeah, so the comment was um, preconditioners. Um, usually in the linear system, you need 
basically, so you can save more time by using the right preconditioner for your particular problem, and the answer is yes, you're absolutely right. Um, even though this is more about the assembly of the system. I mean, once you have the system ready, um, of course, you can still hand this over to the same linear, syst uh, linear solver package. So here, here it's much more about the convenience rather than resolving a performance bottleneck. All right, any more questions? What not then? Yeah, thank you again. <laughs>